Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar, Building Blocks of a GMP Chamber, the importance of calibration, validation, and monitoring. We're so glad you could join us today um, for our presentation. We have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation today. And if you have a question you would like our panel to answer, you can submit it in the question box on your control panel on the right side of the screen. Also in the control panel here, you'll see a handout section with a PDF of the presentation, which is available for you to download. The webinar is being recorded today and you will receive that recording within 24 hours after the webinar. This is a live webinar, so please bear with us in case of technical difficulties on our end. If you experience any difficulties during the webinar, the best thing to try is to just log out and log back in using the same join link. It usually solves most problems. And now I would like to hand um, the reins over to Phil Kendall, who will introduce our panelists. <clears throat> Thank you, Amy, and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, today we'll be covering with three panelists, and starting with myself. I am Phil Kendall. I am the Calibration Product Manager here at Massey, and followed up by Kevin Niskevich, who is our Validation Business Development Manager down in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, in our office down there. And batting cleanup today will be George Barrow. George is our monitoring systems product manager. So everybody's asking, you know, why, why are we doing this webinar today? And we've actually had, since the pandemic started, we've had a, a many, many calls about calibrating, validating, and qualifying chambers. Um, and it's from a lot of non-traditional customers of ours. So you have um, pharmacies looking to get minus 80 freezers. You have, you know, ballrooms set up at different hotels setting up um, vaccination sites that need freezers on site. And they want to make sure that those chambers are up and running properly and actually at the temperature that they say they are. So we thought this was a very pertinent webinar and uh, we're happy to present it to you today. So because we have such a diverse audience, we figured I'd start off about what is GMP and, and why does it matter? And GMP is the main regulatory standard for ensuring pharmaceutical quality, but I figured I'd give you the definition from the FDA and it's also on the ISPE website, which for those who don't know, ISPE is the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers. And it says that GMP refers to the good manufacturing practice regulations promulgated by the US Food and Drug Administration under the authority of the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. These regulations, which have the force of law, require that manufacturers, processes, and packages of drugs, medical devices, some food, and blood take proactive steps to ensure that their products are safe, pure, and effective. GMP is also referred to sometimes as CGMP. The C stands for current. Reminding manufacturers that they must employ technologies and systems which are up to date in order to comply with the regulation. Systems and equipment used to prevent contamination, mix-ups, and errors, which may have been cutting edge 20 years ago, may be less than adequate by today's standards. Now, a perfect example of this is the chart recorder. 20, 30 years ago, a chart recorder was cutting edge for recording the temperature in a you know, extended period of time in the chamber. And but today's technology far, far surpasses the what a chart recorder can do. So that will be covered more by George and that monitoring system. So next slide, please. So now we go, the importance of calibration in GMP. Well, it all starts with a known measurement. But with that, let's start what calibration is. It is the comparison of measurement and test equipment of unknown accuracy to a measurement standard of known accuracy in order to eliminate any variation in the accuracy of the instrument under test. And you say, oh, that's all nice and good, but why, why is it important in GMP? Well, it's to establish the reliability of the instrument so it can be trusted. You can then locate and correct faults at times when there are any deviations. It also maintains quality control and assurance in production and reduces waste. The accuracy of the instrument's readings affects the decision-making process for any production stage, and an incorrect measurement can lead to quality, safety, and compliance issues. Not to mention immense waste of money if you have to throw away 
either active pharmaceutical ingredients, finished product, or anything that is storing in those temperatures. And finally, you also obtain traceability documentation, which is the calibration certificate. And these measurements from these instruments need to be consistent with similar measurements taken from others, which is NIST traceable is the common language or traceable for the SI. So by having your instrument calibrated and compared to a standard allows for greater control at any stage of manufacturing and testing during your validation process. Next slide, please. So let's go into the calibration of a control of a chamber. And it all starts with the controller. The controller sets the temperature or provides the energy to maintain a temperature that you set it to. So we first start with taking the reading of that probe for the controller. Once we have that reading, we will put a standard inside next to the probe and compare the, the measurements from the standard to what it's reading on the chamber. Now, typically, the controller probe will be calibrated at one point, which is the operating temperature. This is because typically the chamber is filled with product or is being used at that temperature. And it is not worthwhile to remove the contents of the, of the chamber to change the temperature to do multiple points. It's also very difficult to remove the controller probe and bring it outside to use in a bath. So we go step two, the controller probe is calibrated at operating temp. And once that is adjusted and found to be intolerance, we move on to the monitoring probe. Now the monitoring probe is what we like to call the record of the day. That, that records, you know, 24 seven, the temperatures, whether they fluctuate or stay the same inside that, temp inside that chamber. Uh, next slide, please. So because the monitoring probe can typically be removed from the chamber, we can take it outside and put, in, put it into a bath at multiple temperatures. Now, we don't, we don't tell the customer which temperatures and what tolerance to calibrate at. We are only going over industry best practices right now and what we see in the, the industry for calibration of a chamber. So typically with the monitoring probe, which I mentioned earlier is the record of the day, we will calibrate at the operating temperature just like the controller probe. And then we will bring it down to the lower limit or the lower set point for the alarm of the, of the chamber. So any, if it, the chamber gets too low in temperature, the alarm will sound. And once that is in, we will go up to the upper end or the upper alarm limit of the controller and we'll calibrate to that. Once you have the controller and the monitoring probe calibrated, you know at that point in time that the reading is true and you have a known measurement. And from there, it is ready to go over for mapping and validation. So Kevin, you can take it away. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Uh, so the next step we're gonna talk about is the validation of your chamber. Um, and this is the second step uh, because we can't validate a chamber if it hasn't been calibrated first. Uh, what you'll see in the diagram here, this is a, a 3D dimensional uh, diagram of a uh, region chamber. This would be the, the minus 7580 freezer uh, that we talked about earlier. And what we're looking to do with validation is uh, temperature mapping. And temperature mapping is a critical component of the thermal validation process for biopharma manufacturers. And we're going to be confirming that the chamber's performance is uniform throughout the chamber. Um, and it's important to, to realize that a validation study, which is usually a 24-hour mapping, is just the snapshot in time, similar to the calibration uh, and the functioning of that CTU. So a CTU, or a control temperature unit, or chamber, um, ISPE Good Practice Guide defines a, a CTU as a controlled temperature chamber a system, unit, equipment, or room in which environmental conditions, usually temperature, of a chamber are controlled, maintained, and regulated to meet specific user requirements. So we're talking about freezers and refrigerators, but this could also include incubators, stability chambers, uh, both reach-in and walk-in chambers, storage rooms, shipping containers, trucks, trailers, and even ovens and sterilizers. Uh, regulatory guidance. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules 
uh, but there are like ISPE, uh, as, as Phil had mentioned, FDA, uh, USP 36 is good storage and distribution practices for drug products. And it defines CTUs as, uh, CTUs are qualified via temperature mapping study to determine the unit's suitability for storing drug products. A suitable number of temp recording devices or sensors should be utilized to record temperatures and provide temp area maps. Thereafter, the unit should be monitored as determined by the results of the mapping study. And George will get into that piece later as we talk about continuous monitoring. Uh, next slide, please. So here's uh, the four steps to uh, validating a GMP chamber. Step one is really creating and reviewing uh, a protocol. And, and this is just a detailed list of the steps that you're going to take uh, to validate that. So temperature mapping and, and everything else that goes into it. Uh, Massey Bioservice bioservices can create a custom protocol and we will always work with the customer um, if they have protocols as well. Step two is preparing in, uh, the validation equipment. So we, you need to get your uh, equipment all together, pre-calibrated and ready to go. Step three would be executing the IOPQ studies, which we'll go over in another slide. And this is generally 24-hour uh, empty and loaded mappings. And then step four is interpreting your data. So you, you have to take a look at the data and then decide what you're going to do with that uh, equipment or chamber when you're all done. Next uh, slide, please. So here's a, a picture of some of our uh, K validators in, in the front row. And this is a standard cart. Uh, that your validation company would show up on site. Uh, we have laptop and uh, KV2Ks in the front row and the newer version of the KAVS in the back row there. Uh, you need some form of uh, data collection and the AVS is what we use here at Massey. That next step, please. Here's some additional uh, equipment that we would use, a data trace is a wireless uh, temperature sensor. You can also uh, do temperature and RH. Uh, Sense Anywhere is our uh, next generation wireless sensor, which is actually cloud-based and uh, what Massey uses for their continuous monitoring system that George will cover. And then on the right is the standard thermocouples or TCs that you use. And these are to uh, very accurate uh, uh, monitor, measuring the temperature within the chamber. Next slide. So uh, this is what we're doing in, in uh, validation is really the IOPQ, uh, which you'll hear quite often. And it really is installation qualification, operational qualification, and performance qualification. Each of these are unique steps, and it was usually done in that order, IQ, OQ, PQ. Uh, IQ, installation qualification, is defined as a documented verification process that equipment has been properly installed and configured according to the standards set by the manufacturer. So you need to confirm that you're uh, hooked up to power and utility correctly. Uh, you have the manufacturer's user's manuals, training documents, uh, any SOPs from the uh, customer site and use, and really just documenting that everything is installed and, and available. When you get into operational qualification, this is to determine that the equipment performance is consistent with the use of requirement specification within the manufacturer specified operating ranges. And what we normally do in an OQ is a 24 hour empty mapping. Um, this is to ensure that uh, we have that uniform temperature throughout the chamber. We'll also do uh, alarm testings and uh, confirm uh, that your uh, unit is set. Then we'll do additional tests similar to open door and power interruption testing to make sure that your uh, chamber is running as specified by the manufacturer. We then get into performance qualification, and this is used to verify the equipment performs as expected under simulated real world conditions. So this is where we are going to do a 24 hour loaded mapping study uh, with the product inside your freezer or refrigerator or unit and make sure that those temperatures uh, stay within the ranges specified. Again, we'll do open door tests, usually in a, a five minute range to simulate uh, regular usage. And uh, power failure recovery test is more of a, uh, for information. So we will 
disconnect uh, power to your unit and monitor the sensors to see how long that chamber can stay within range. This is information needed if you have a power failure and have to get to uh, your ingredients or products stored and know, uh, you know how quickly you need to get to uh, move that to another facility. Um, so again, yep, thank you. Uh, the validation process, when we go through all this, will ensure that your unit is running at its temperature and within its ranges at that time. And then we will talk about the continuous monitoring so that we can ensure that that product and chamber stays within its ranges 24 seven. And I'll pass it on to George. Thank you, Kevin. Last, but certainly not least, is the importance of monitoring and the use of a GMP chamber. A GMP chamber record and alarm strategy stand on the foundation built from quality, calibration, and validation services. Nonetheless, all the good work that goes into calibrating and validating a chamber does not add up to much if you cannot provide a record that your product or samples have been stored correctly during their life in a chamber of yours. Your monitoring system provides that end of day record. If well utilized, that record acts as your proof that material has been held within its specified conditions, be it temperature, humidity, CO2, um, light, so on and so forth, and most importantly, how long it has been out of those specifications. In addition to environmental condition data trending, your monitoring system should be able to provide the logs and audit trails of how quickly excursions are handled and reported on. Excursions from power fluctuations, a, a door left ajar, for instance, are all to be expected. So it's all about how they responded to that really matters. Your monitoring system should aid you in creating those much needed records that can be made available for an audit or a visit from regulatory officials. This being said, alarms are a good thing. They are the much needed feature that protects the integrity of your research or stored material. Making sure that your system has the capability to provide you or your staff the proper alarms when and how they are needed is critical to a successful alarm strategy. Common features to look for beyond the common delivery methods of email, text messaging, or phone calls are customizable alarm delays, the ability to change alarm parameters in bulk for multiple sensors at once, alarm profiles that automatically activate based on the time of day or the day itself, and escalation lists uh, with different delays between tiers. With features like these in use, you can get alarms swiftly sent to the right people and avoid alarm fatigue by having most alarms only be tripped when there is a situation that truly needs attention. Another key of a well-utilized monitoring system data record is for diagnostic or analytical purposes. These trends very much act as an EKG for your chamber. If put in place early in a chamber's life, it is easy to determine what your chamber, when healthy, looks like. Each one is different. HVAC and facilities teams can utilize this data to make very well-informed decisions on fixes, adjustments, and preventative maintenance. Some companies, when storing critical or valuable material, or want to just provide an extra layer of protection, take this monitoring to a different level. In addition to monitoring the internal conditions of a chamber, sensors can be added to the compressor system or steam systems at strategic locations that can catch or even predict failures days, weeks, or even months before they can occur. We apply this technique of proactive monitoring here at Massey in our biorepository and some customer monitoring installations as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, using built-in monitoring solutions is more typical of companies in a pre-GMP phase, making the move to GMP, focusing on R&D or traditionalist facilities that do not yet know the reliability and cost savings that an independent central monitoring system provide. There are a few notable dangers of using a chamber's built-in monitoring capability to be aware of. First off, single point of failure. Using a monitor that is tied to a chamber's power or controller puts you at risk of losing monitoring at the most critical time, a power or controller failure. Also, local chamber, chamber alarms, such as audio and visual that uh, originate from the chamber cannot be relied on. This has become painfully obvious by a lot of labs these last several months who are very used to being near their chambers each and every day. Without a central monitoring system, they cannot really be confident about the safety of their material 
especially from remote locations. Now, chart recorders, which are sometimes built in or added on to a chamber, using paper are prone to failure themselves with either the paper or an operator not handling them properly. They are delicate. This wastes significant labor time and puts chart recorder users at significant risk. Risk. Uh, these are just a few reasons as to why you need an independent monitoring system, preferably battery powered. I say preferably battery powered since these systems, especially wireless systems, make it so each sensor has the capability to independently operate and record data in the event of a power or network failure. It's all about lim eliminating those single points of failure that can cause large scale monitoring loss. There are systems out there that have sensors running and transmitting on one, three, five, or even 10 year battery lives. The system we work with, uh, Sense Anywhere, can provide a 10 year battery at five minute intervals, for instance. This pretty much eliminates the time consuming, costly, and error prone uh, need to replace batteries frequently. In monitoring of a GMP chamber, redundancy is king in a well designed setup. Power, network, and computing infrastructure failures are just facts of life, and your chosen system needs to be designed to account for these. Ensure that your system can operate independently for a time without facility power or network. Ideally, your system sensors can cache data for a number of days, and modern systems should be able to automatically upload data to your server upon restoration without any time-consuming human interaction. It should also be able to back check that cached data for any excursions that happened during the failure and alert you to any. You do not want to have a system that has first in first out memory since if the failure is prolonged, the most important data is those first few hours at the beginning of the failure. Now, what about a server crash? The computer itself, the database itself. Your system or IT infrastructure should be capable of swiftly detecting a crash and restoring the last database backup. Make sure that backups are taken very often as infrequent backups can result in you having a gruesome data gap upon restoration of that backup. It's also best to have some spare sensors at your site in case a monitoring sensor malfunctions or is broken. Every second counts, so being able to swap in a calibrated sensor helps eliminate a troublesome scenario. In these last few years, there have been a massive migration and general warming up to cloud systems, especially recently. These types of systems offer quick deployment, low capital costs, and less of a burden to your IT group if the software is hosted by a provider of repute, such as Microsoft Azure or AWS. This also puts the onus on the provider to keep systems running, scaling, and to apply security updates. Locally installed systems, not cloud systems, on the other hand, generally have a much larger capital investment, but offers the highest amount of security control for the most locked down and stringent operations. It's all in-house. Cloud providers are well aware of the caution that companies approach cloud security with for GMP purposes. And unsurprisingly, they have paid keen attention to this. They want that business. So providing, they, they have provided the needed documentation about their cloud computing in those GXP spaces. Also, the accuracy of your monitoring system plays a largely understated role in the well-being of your material storage. After all, your sensor accuracy and calibration quality is the difference between an out-of-spec situation or not. For instance, 0 .0, 0 0.1 degrees Celsius can make all the difference when seeing if a chamber was out of spec for an hour or just barely in spec, possibly trashing or saving all the valuable material stored within. Especially with stability studies where conditions are required to be very tight, a sensor's accuracy can make or break the integrity of a study. Monitoring sensor accuracy is not just a nice to have feature when your valuable material is on the line. Additionally, determining where to place your monitoring sensors or sensors, uh, sensor or sensors is a critical decision. This is another reason as to why mapping your chamber is key, like Kevin was talking about, as this provides you the data to make this informed decision about sensor placement. Typically, a sensor of record gets placed at the chamber average location or worst case location, depending on a given company's operating procedures and risk tolerance. This data also allows you to know the locations, the data from the mapping that is, know the locations that are more prone to instability, allowing you to place additional sensors in these locations to provide an extra layer of security and early warning. Whatever alarm strategy you go with, 
make sure that you have this documented as the logic behind sensor locations, sensor quantities, and how are they reported on will all come up as questions in a thorough audit. Lastly, uh, in GMP environments, 21 CFR Part 11 compliance and computer systems validations of your monitoring system is necessary. Since this is a computer system in which users need to sign in for alterations, they need to log on, respond to alarms, etc., this clearly requires software built for Part 11 compliance. And this should be your first question you ask when looking for a GMP monitoring system for your chambers. Also, validation of your monitoring system is just as important as the validation of your chamber. In order for the data to be trusted, the system should undergo validation, and most importantly, you need proof that the alarms will trip like you claim they will, and these events get properly recorded in the system. If something isn't working or set up right, the validation is exactly your chance to catch that before material becomes or well, comes and goes through a chamber that has its monitoring alarms not activated properly, for instance. Lastly, I'll touch on DIY versus vendor validation of your monitoring system. If you have staff with the correct background to do the validation, fantastic. Just know that if done well, this could be very costly and time-consuming project, oftentimes costing more than just having opted for the vendor to provide this. At the very least, you should ask your vendor uh, for validation protocols uh, or in documentation, see if it's available for their system, so that way you can save significant time if you can use those and just move straight to execution. Knowing the proper bases are covered, uh, you, you can know that the pro proper bases are covered in a vendor document, um, well, because they eat, sleep, and breathe uh, the system that they provide. If you do not have trained in-house computer system validation staff, ask if the vendor can validate the system they provide. This comes with a cost, of course, but should offer a much faster, more efficient route to having the documentation you need for your GMP operation. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much. George, thank you very much for that presentation. And I just want to thank you and Olga again, for those who don't know. George and his wife are actually expecting a baby today, but he's here doing the presentation. And I'm so home to uh, be with his lovely wife and their soon to be new baby. So thank you, George, for being here. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you, George, and thank you to all our panelists, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our webinar. We're going to go into a brief question and answer session now. If you get, if you have a question and you haven't had a chance to submit it, feel free to type it into the question box on your control panel, and we will answer as many as we can. Um, so I'll just start. Um, the first question we had was, how do you determine how much load to use during the PQ? What is a, a good rule of thumb for this? Uh, it's a very good question. I'll answer that on the validation side. Um, well, generally, as we, we talked about in the PQ section, uh, we want to simulate real world conditions. So if you have the actual product that you're going to be storing in that freezer, uh, we load it with that. And you want to load it as you would normally load that freezer. And, and what we find in the industry usually is that freezers are usually stuffed all the way to the top, um, which is why, if you remember in the validation uh, picture, the 3D picture with the sensors, we are generally mapping out in the uh, top, middle, and bottom planes, all four corners and in the center so that we can uh, really grid out that freezer. Um, so we would like to use the actual uh, materials that you would be storing in there uh, for real. Uh, but if you don't have that available and you need a PQ done, you can use empty boxes, you can use filled boxes. If it's going to be uh, liquid, you can use filled liquids uh, with water in there to simulate, uh, but, but the real product is usually the best. Okay, great. Um, another question, what are your thoughts on sensor placement according to the ISPE guidelines for warehouse monitoring? Maybe George, you could address this. George? Um, actually, Kevin, do you know that off the top of your head? Well, uh, yeah, placement, and I believe this was for a warehouse, you said, Amy? 
Um, was it specifically that, for yes, warehouse? warehouse monitoring? Thoughts on sensor placement according to ISPE guidelines for warehouse monitoring? Uh, I mean, in general, uh, if, if you look at a warehouse as a, as a big square uh, chamber, like we, we presented earlier, um, we are going to do the same thing. We're going to use three planes. We'll use the top, middle, and bottom levels of sensors. And we will, you know, generally array those sensors, obviously more than the 16 we showed on the CTU uh, diagram. Um, we've done warehouses where we're using hundreds of sensors at the same time. But you want to map it out so that you know that if you're in or out of range within any particular uh, area, you want to be able to pinpoint that. Um, a lot of times the issues will be around doors and uh, air handling vents and uh, outside walls and windows and such as that uh, will be hot or cold spots for you. Um, so the number of sensors really depends on the size of uh, your warehouse and what you're trying to map. ISPE for a chamber will say a minimum amount of sensors would be 10. Um, and at Massey, we generally will use a minimum of 16. So the 15 array, top, middle, and bottom corners and sensor, and then one also by the control probe, uh, as you'll see. Thank you, Kevin. And yeah, that, the mapping, uh, as we you know, showed in our webinar, plays a critical role in the locations that are chosen for monitoring locations. So if going through the process, uh, use a vendor um, like ourselves that can quote to uh, whatever requirements you have based on the product you have and whatever regulations you're trying to follow, like ISB, World Health Organization, or something else. Okay, great. Um, I have another question. How long for an open door test and what is the pass fail criteria for this test or is it for informational purposes only? Uh, this is for informational purposes. Um, a, a standard pass, uh, open door will be five minutes, uh, but again, you want to simulate real world. So if it's a walk-in chamber, uh, that may be 20 or 30 minutes uh, where you're moving a lar large amount of uh, product in and out. Uh, if it's a, a reach-in chamber, you know, to open a door, put your product in and, and close it, it, it's normally around five minutes. And it will tell you how quickly your chamber will uh, keep its... Um, temperature and, and uh, stabilize temperature once that door is closed. Gotcha. That will be defined in the SOPs and protocol uh, that the customer either has or uh, is developed with a uh, validation company. Okay. Um, what, what are the intervals for qualification and calibration? Well, I know for calibration, the intervals are set forth by the customer and what their um, quality system and risk management or, or risk tolerance is. Um, what we typically see in the industry is for um, critical components such as a chamber, um, they could start with, with you know, either um, three or six months. And once they have established a you know three or four intervals where they have passed and there's no adjustments then they have justification to expand it further out so going from three to six to six to twelve months and then for uh, chamber validation uh, full IOPQ is uh, normally completed with a new chamber when it's uh, first installed um, requalification again is is based on the customer um, Intervals can be anywhere from every year, uh, every three years, every five years. Uh, I believe in Europe, they are trying to move the five-year uh, cycle at least to every three years. And again, it's risk mit uh, mitigation. Um, so if you have a lot of very expensive uh, product that you're storing, you, you may want to test uh, more often. And it's important to also know to requalify uh, should, uh, you know any any changes in that chamber happen if you move the chamber or a new compressors installed or anything like that uh you probably want to have that chamber requalified again okay i have another question from the audience uh what is the worst case probe location based on mapping for a cold room it's a good question uh from our temperature mapping um again we're going to get both the hottest, coldest, and then we would calculate the average temperature spaces. 
Um, so for a CTU, it depends on your SOP. Uh, you know, if it's a, a, a cold or hot sensitive product, then you, you would set it accordingly to the hottest or coldest spot in the area. Uh, a lot of places, a lot of CTUs will uh, monitor the average temperature and then set the uh, tolerance range plus or minus uh, depending on the uh, temperatures that we're monitoring. Yeah, and from the monitoring perspective, that, that worst case location is very much determined by the thermal mapping. Once you know where that is, you can define your alarm strategy, whether or not you want it to be at the average location of the chamber, which some companies feel that that is more representative of the overall product store, or place that in the worst case location as revealed by the mapping. It's gonna be different with every chamber. Uh, place that in the worst case location, and there you can be confident from, you know, generally confident, chambers do change, especially with product moving in and out. Um, so, you know, we're obviously doing the best. It's all best practices. Um, if, if you have it in the worst case location, so if you're doing a freezer or a cold room, that's typically gonna be the hottest, of course, because going a little too cold is generally better than a little too warm. Um, putting that there, when you get alarms and you respond to those alarms, you have a higher degree of confidence that, um, that the, the rest of the chamber is still in spec. So definitely both alarm strategies have their, have their merit, um, but these locations are revealed by the thermal mapping. Okay. Another question, how high in a freezer should you place your TCs during validation? How high to place them? Um, can you go back to, I think it's slide seven, Amy. We'll look at that 3D diagram, the start of the validation. Sure, we, we can do that. So the, the goal with placing your validation sensors, that's the next one here, is to, again, three planes. So you'll see sensors one through five is our top, six through 10 are middle, and 11 through 15 are bottom plane. Uh, you wanna be, generally be about an inch from each of the corners. Um, and, and then our 16th probe is going next to the control sensor uh, that we've already calibrated. Um, and so that is our control there. And then we are going to be able to grid out this entire chamber. So uh, roughly one inch from the corners, top, middle, and bottom is uh, probably the best answer for that. Um, but you want to be able to place it there so that we have the entire perimeter of that chamber mapped and can make uh, adjustments and, and decisions based upon the data that we receive. Okay. A um, couple more here. Thank you guys for all your questions. There's a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> um, why would you do a 24 hour test and not three tests or 24 hour test when validating a chamber? Uh, 24 hours is pretty standard. Uh, we do other chambers and, and walk-ins. Some, some are three-day studies. When we do a warehouse, uh, common is a seven-day study. And you're trying, again, to capture the real-world usage. So in a warehouse, seven days will capture five days of uh, usage, uh, everybody in and out, um, uh, lift uh, usage and everything else, doors open and closed, deliveries. Uh, and then also weekends where usually it will be uh, quieter. So a 24 hour for a chamber is enough to gather that information, um, open doors, have product going in and out uh, and still get a, a very good temperature mapping for that. So 24 hours is pretty standard. It can be longer, um, but 24 hours is, is, is pretty standard for the acceptable uh, minimum. And I, I'd like to add too, um, obviously, so this is focused on a chamber where the 24 hours is the standard, but as Kevin said, like a warehouse, seven days can be a standard. Uh, LN2 tanks usually is one full LN2 cycle. So just whoever you're getting your validation information from, you know, make sure they have a long history in the validation field and know the appropriate protocols to be used for the chamber type. And also from the monitoring perspective, um, if you're going to choose a 24 hour period or say three 24 hour periods, Either one, the thing that really is the linchpin to it, that really tops it all off, is getting your monitoring in before and keeping it in after your validation study. Because your validation study proves that either things need to be adjusted or everything looks great. And your monitoring probe, your monitoring system, is what, is what shows that you have stayed in that 24-hour period type of tolerance for continuity until your recall. 
Okay. Another validation question, Kevin, you're on the spot today. Um, if a logger fails during mapping, can you use data from neighboring loggers to derive conclusions or should you redo the mapping? Very good question. And then keep the validation questions coming. We're happy to answer them. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, so so uh, it, it's generally accepted that 10% of your uh, sensors can possibly fail and still have a valid validation uh, study. So in the sense of 16, you're only going to be able to get rid of uh, one, possibly two of your sensors. And after that, the study would need to be repeated. Um, so in this diagram here, if number seven were to lose data and not record, uh, we would be able to then still continue the study. Whether or not that corner in seven can be inferred that six, two, 10, and eight are all within range um, would need to be determined, but, but that unit would still pass as long as 90% uh, or more of the sensors are within range. I hope that answers the question for you. Okay. Um, supposing a plant growing chamber, would you do the mapping all the way through the growth of the plants? I don't know if this is something you have experience with, Kevin, or not, or if you have Thoughts? Uh, I don't. Uh, and again, um, validation is a snapshot in time. So uh, we would take a chamber and uh, a plant growing chamber, I would assume, would have temperature and humidity uh, involved. So, uh, you know, we would test and study both of those for a 24 hour or a longer period. Um, and then it would really fall to your continuous monitoring system, which, since anywhere or another unit, would again be measuring temperature and RH in those uh, areas. Um, we can also uh, test light sensitivity and the power of your, or your light sources as well uh, if it's some type of grow chamber. Um, but validation is really just that snapshot in time for your 24 hour study and your continuous monitoring um, would tell you whether you're in range during the life cycle of that, that growing process. I can add something to that too actually from a um, little bit of experience in and uh, especially the fledgling marijuana business uh, in a lot of states. So when monitoring that, and this would go from mapping to area two for ideal conditions, because a little bit of temperature fluctuation, CO2 fluctuation or RH can have actually a massive yield difference on the plants. So there's soil temperature could be a factor, um, but canopy plays a huge role into those scenarios as well. So the disbursement of how you want sensors based on what plants you're growing can be totally different. Very cool field, actually. Mm. Okay. Um, I have another question. What if um, in a cold room, worst case, warm spot in location, how, how do you mount the probe for life cycle of the system, i.e. 48 inches from the floor? How do you anchor the probe? That the question? I, I'm guessing. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so, yeah, I'll take that one. So if, if you end up having, well, generally, um, this diagram that we're still on, that's actually what nice, um, does a good, shows a good representation of um, how to place the sensors. So when you're establishing, like in a cold room, your product storage envelope, you want to make sure that you have identified the corners. And of course, the, the central ones, the middle ones as well. By doing that type of a placement, you will generally get um, typically two, three inches off the ground or off the corners to be away from um, a conductor like metal or beat is where you're going to have um, your sensors, your mapping sensors. So if all your mapping sensors are gathering data from the extremes of your product storage envelope, the vastly most common scenario is that we'll then find from that data that the monitoring sensor needs to be in one of those locations, of course. So that, that should take you to um, an, an actually close to the ground type of scenario. I believe the question was 48 inches. So mm -hmm. if, if your situation requires 48 inches off the ground, then for that scenario, um, you would have to use, depending on what type of sensor you're using, if you're using one with an external pro um, and you can put the transmitter, or if you're using a hardwired system that's just like a long thermocouple, for instance, you would have to wire the probe there, come up with a apparatus to actually hold it there. Um, now, generally, that's not the case, like I said, but if that's the case, then uh, you could use a pole. Um, like val our validation team has a, a lot of equipment to get to these hard to reach places. 
especially for warehouses. We've had to hang sensors. We've had to use 20 foot poles. Um, there's plenty of ways to do it. And uh, actually, if, if there's a scenario out there, uh, we'd be happy to help with that. So reach out after the webinar. Definitely. And I apologize, we may not get to all of these questions today, but feel free to um, reach out to us after the fact too. And if any, you have any additional questions or follow-up questions. Um, I think I'm going to run at least one more here. There's a question referring back to what you spoke of earlier, Kevin. Um, does the 10% that Kevin spoke of also imply to thermocouples? And where does the 10% number come from? Uh, it's a good question. I know that uh, that is Massey's policy. I don't know of the guidance that would indicate that the 90%, um, but I can find out if somebody wants to email me that question, I'd be more than happy to follow up on that. Okay, I can do that. I, I, believe, it, I believe it, it, it does refer to all sensors that you'd be putting in there, so thermocouples or wireless sensors, um, what have you. And of, of course, that can that can change. Um, so, if if the one that failed, for instance, is near the control probe, and the and the person doing the, the equipment owner determines that that, based on like risk assessment, determines that that was too critical to actually accept. At the end of the day, that 10% value is totally up to the customer. That being said, that the 10% value stems from the fact that um, you know this is, the validation industry has been around for quite some time. Sensors failing, especially for longer studies than 24 hours, like you know, LN2 studies can go for weeks, um, and warehouse studies a week. Uh, sensors failing is just another one of those facts of life. So it's generally industry standard, it very much is, to have some tolerance of what can fail. But at the end of the day, that still does need to be reviewed every time to see if the tolerance, the risk tolerance, is actually acceptable for that sensor failure. Mm. Okay. Um, another one probably for you, George. Can you outline core features that may be important to look for in a new monitoring system? Sure, and, and I touched on a few of those in the, in the webinar. So first off, what you need to do is make sure that the one that you are looking for is designed for GMP use. Um, you, you don't want it to be designed for something else and then fit into you know, round pegs into a, fair, a square hole, for instance. Um, so make sure that it's for GMPU specifically, and it has the reputation for that. Uh, you, you all, redundancy is king. I, I mentioned that earlier. You really need a redundant system because data, 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 data is the requirement at the end of the day. You need that record. And without redundancy, every, every lack of redundancy a system has, like no onboard memory, uh, really infrequent intervals, uh, alarm systems that uh, that trip and then don't activate themselves until they're reset, for instance. You need a system that's very well designed from a redundancy standpoint. But the most important thing is when looking for a monitoring system, know your use case. Come to the come to the conversation with vendors with a user requirement specification. That is where you can at least have an informed discussion with the vendor about if their system can mesh up with your, your most important needs. And if you don't have this type of a, a document, like a URS, um, go to a vendor of, of quite some experience and they'll be happy to work with you. Um, that includes, of course, Massey ourselves uh, to, to make these requirements and see how that meshes up for you. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna end on a Val question because it's apparently all about Val today. <laughs> um, Kevin, how often for GMP, should I requalify my CTUs after the initial qualification? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I did touch on it earlier. Um, it really comes down to the end users' uh, risk and SOPs. Um, that length is anywhere from annually uh, to every three years. Uh, some are doing it every five years and trying to compress it, as I mentioned. Uh, Requals are important anytime something in that chamber changes so anything major that changes you want to requalify so uh you know anything that could affect the drug product temperature stored within you want to requalify but generally every one to three years is a good uh, time frame for uh requalification and it's it's different than your standard full iopq where we're doing the full installation uh, qualification now if you move a chamber uh it's probably best to do the iq as well 
uh, but a lot of requalifications will just be a, a single 24-hour mapping uh, to show that, you know, uh, relative to the IOPQ done previously on that chamber, that all of your temperatures are still within its operation radius. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your questions. Um, as I said, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar if you have more questions or would like follow-up specifically from one of our panelists. I'm going to we have our contact info is on the PDF that you um, received at the, sorry, my screen is not going where I want it to, I apologize. <laughs> um, but definitely keep in touch with us, contact us through the PDF handout on the bottom of your webinar control panel and visit us online at masi.com. Um, we'd be happy to chat with you or answer any further questions you may have. Um, you will receive a recording of the webinar within 24 hours, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.